have to see y'all. Or nice to see the shadow of some of y'all, because we got some lights. Uh, who's first time meeting my wife? Who has already met my wife? What's that supposed to mean? Just kidding. Do you guys know this guy? Uh, we're thrilled to be here. Thank y'all for coming out and for helping bring us out. We haven't uh, been here together ever in Atlanta. I've never been. It's my first time. That answers that question. So I know we're on a timer. I see it going. We don't want to waste our time. Exactly. Uh, a lot of fun stuff to still do today. So let's go ahead and uh, see if there's some questions. Hi. Hi, my name is Karen. Thank you for coming to Atlanta. Thanks, Karen. All right, my question is for both of you. So I was wondering if there were any Easter eggs you both included for your characters in Supernatural that you don't think people have noticed and you would like to share with us. Oh, funny. That's a great question. Um, there are a few Easter eggs in Walker in regards to Supernatural coming up um, that I'm sure a lot will notice. <clears throat> oh my God. Easter eggs and Supernatural, that's a good question. A lot of stuff I stole from Seth. Well, Emily has her tattoo. Emily? Emily has the stars. Emily has the stars. Which I had in Wildfire, so it's not Supernatural, but yeah. not to Chris, I guess. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I just wear tall shoes. Yes. <laughs> that's Chris. Yes. She has a tall husband and co-star. So even today, I don't know how she walks around in those. <laughs> I don't have to lean down. Exactly. Again. They're what? They're platforms? Platforms. Oh, platforms. Oh, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't know. You should by now. Well, I'd be like eight feet tall. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Right. I think you own that shirt. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I do, yeah. Uh, bravo. Um, you look better in it. <laughs> um, I'm gonna read off my phone because I'm really nervous. Um, <laughs> so um, I work on film sets as a background actor, and I've noticed that even in short scenes, can take hours to film with several takes. So for someone who really wants to go into acting as a career, how do you guys maintain that authenticity and stay true to the dialogue even on take like 15? That's a great question. Um, do you work here in Atlanta or around Georgia? How cool. Uh, I, th I guess everybody has their own method and finding a way that works for you. For me, um, and this has been since my days on Gilmore Girls um, and New York Minute. Thank you. Hold your applause, please. I don't know, your, uh, daughter, your daughter would disagree. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, by the time I get to set, all my work is done. Like, I know what I'm filming this, I know what I'm filming Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday already in my head. And I'll go through it in the morning, the scenes of the day. I already know what I'm doing, but I'll, I'll get to such that when I'm on set, when they call action, I'm ready to give everything. But once they call cut, you have to kind of like recharge your battery. So we're joking around. I know we've had a lot of uh, actors and actresses who have worked on Supernatural with us or Walker who are like, yeah, there'll be like a crying scene and they're joking around until they call action. And I was like, ding, you know? Um, because you kind of have to, when you're, if you're, for me, every time they call action, I'm sprinting. Even if it's a scene that I don't say much. It doesn't have to be a funny scene or a dramatic scene. It's like, I'm there 100% for whatever my character's doing. And so once they call cut, I have to plug my battery in, you know? And whether it means goofing around or checking Wordle or a text message or something, um, I have to kind of like wash it away and it almost, it, as long as you're prepared, then it almost feels fresh every time and look for different things to do. Um, it's almost like if there's a scene where we're here and talking and we do take one and then we go back, then I know what this feels like. So what does it feel like to grab my water in the midst of it and open it and have trouble with it? And then take three, what if I grab my water and it spills a little bit? And so you kind of like add layers with each take if you can. And sometimes it's like, well, we got that take, let's go to the next scene, or let's go to the close-ups or something. You have to match what you did. But just to, to stay to stay there, to stay in the moment um, as best you can. And if you feel, somebody told me this a long time ago, I don't know who, unfortunately, but I've now since told a lot of people the same thing. If you feel uncomfortable in a scene, you probably look uncomfortable. 
which works if you're supposed to be uncomfortable in the scene. But if we're doing a scene and I'm just like, what do my hands do? Like, then I'm gonna, f so figure out how you feel comfortable. Um, you know, figure out what it is. So, you know, like if your character is a little anxious and you're kind of like just playing with the, the fabric on the back of the chair, but it helps you be there, then that's kind of what I try and find. And so the first take of every scene you do, you've done it in your head a thousand times, but you haven't done it on set in front of the director and the rest of the cast and crew. Um, and with this actor or actress, you don't know what they're gonna bring or what you thought they were gonna bring, but they don't, it's fine, you flow with it. Maybe they're right and you're like, there's no right or wrong, it's art. Um, and so for me, I just try and be really over-prepared. Um, yeah. <laughs> you? <laughs> Ditto. He's really long-winded, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and he's a scene stealer! Um, no, uh, to echo, uh, or to, to go back, I actually, my first, um, my first time on set was as a background actor as well, um, in A Beautiful Mind, and I just remember just observing, and even on my first movie, I remember showing up to set, and I never had been on set in that capacity as an actor, and I would just sit and I would watch and study and understand, and soak up everyone's techniques. You know, like what works for them cannot work for me. Um, but to echo and piggyback what Jerry was saying, the over-preparation, knowing it, like nobody's business so that when you do show up on set it never gets old because you know it so well that you can find all the new things in every scene so it doesn't get old because you don't want to repeat you don't want to repeat it yeah and there's something um just occurred to me because i just met an actor who i have been a big fan of for a long time uh just met him back uh backstage um <clears throat> garrett delahunt <laughs> a giant fan of his work I was always hoping to meet him and work with him one day. So I just kind of like interrupted him. He was in the middle of the conversation. I was like, hey, sorry, just big fan. He's like, okay. It's like, cool. He's really nice. He's really nice. But there's something about when someone's really prepared um, in a scene, there's almost, you hear somebody has like stage presence or somebody, you know, you could put Sean Penn anywhere in the background and your eye goes to him. You're like, that, that's like a real person. Like, do they even know that they're shooting a scene right now? Because they just feel real. So just, Center yourself, find yourself, and, and feel at home, and you'll look at home. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congrats. <laughs> Hello there. Hi, I'm Carrie Yale, and my question is, if the Winchesters didn't get canceled, would you consider making a cameo? I wanted to last year, when they were still going, but it was, it was in New Orleans, uh, and we were shooting in Austin. Uh, for sure. And Jess and I talked about it, and it just was one of those things where I couldn't sneak away. EPing and being the dude in the cowboy hat on the poster takes a lot of time. And back to the prior question, like there's a lot of prep to it as well. So I, I rarely get time off, uh, much to my wife's chagrin. She gets to raise the kids while I get to go play pretend uh, more often than not. Um, but yeah, I would love to. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a bunch. Welcome to Atlanta. Thank you. Thanks. So I think I know the answer to this question. Okay, thank you for your question. Yeah. Next. <laughs> In a race between Chris on Wildfire and Cordell, who wins? On a horse or on a foot? Both. <laughs> Both. She's fast. Am I allowed to cheat? You're not a cheater. But can I like, kick her before they call action? As long as she gets to kick you back. They put no, Alex like in that. his water. She would, she would probably win both. It depends. I did. I can, I can beat you in a... In what, Pac-Man? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes, I have can. Have you told that story? No. <laughs> Maybe I have. Uh, she... <laughs> we'll get back to your question. <laughs> she, we had, she had in her apartment, we started dating, this little Pac-Man machine, you know, with its two-player, like, pizza huts and stuff. You put a quarter the cocktail, in. yeah, the cocktail pack me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and she was really good at it because she grew my up. My grandma that. had it, so that was like our thing. Is we played Pac Man with each other. So every time I'd stay with my grandmother, we would play Pac Man, and I was the best. She was really good. Uh, still is, but. So I beat him. She had the high score. Several times. She had the high score, and so I didn't like it, and so I sit there and play it, 
and it'd be like, we were dating, we were engaged, oh, we had kids, it'd be like, time to go out to dinner, and I'm like, one second. Like, I don't know, that's why I remind her, whenever she thinks I'm acting like an idiot, I'm like, you married me, like, you know. Long story short, it got to the point, this was like summer in Los Angeles of 08 or 09, 09 I guess, and I was playing it so much, there's a little toggle joystick, that my fingers started bleeding, so I had a glove. He I had wear. gloves! <laughs> I he also had like a water bottle with a straw so he could yeah. bend and drink at the same time. I have that hat that has the little thing that you can drink from, <laughs> like a beer at a football game. Uh, We're not a competitive family. Yeah, not at all, not at all. Uh, she would probably win. I think you'd win. However... You're such a gentleman. You are. You would win. I'm pretty fast in a lap. I did win that lap. Yes, but I won the marathon. She did. But that's the best. She did. Thank you. And now we're going to be in a fight for the rest of the weekend because of your question. Thanks a bunch. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. World War III is about to... Yeah, exactly. Hi, my name's Ngazi. Hi, Ngazi. Welcome to Atlanta. Thank you. Good to see you. Great. Um, so my question is, after being on Supernatural for so long, where you're like, you have this team, you know all these people, and then transitioning to being um, both an executive producer and the only person on the poster, like, what was it like to make that transition almost so quickly after you wrapped up Supernatural? Great question. Uh, simply put, really scary. You know, I, the, since Friday the 13th in 08, I haven't really done, yeah, it was a great movie. I uh, had a great time doing it. I haven't really done anything other than Supernatural between summer of 08 and uh, fall of 2020. Um, Ironically, because the pandemic happened then, I had a lot of time to prepare, back to the earlier question. So I had like six months to try and figure out who Walker was gonna be. Um, I still knew who Sam was, and she has a shirt that says, I miss Sam. I miss Sam too. I think a lot of us do. Um, so luckily, and it's, we had a similar thing at the beginning of Walker that we did at the beginning of Supernatural, and that I think we were the first CBS studio show to go back to filming after the pandemic. So they were still trying to like figure out if it could work or if someone was going to get sick and be gone for two weeks or get the whole cast and crew sick. So we all had our masks on, we were all social distancing, and, but we were like, it, it, it bound us together. It binded us? It didn't bound us, bind it? Like we were, to what? Bound? You mean because of the regulations and rules? Well, uh, yeah, like we were, the, we were like the little engine that killed. Same with Supernatural, you know? Season one, we went from WB to CW. Uh, season two, we had new characters that were not gonna last, but they wanted them in. Season three, there was the writer strike. Season four, you know, we, we got moved again. You know, so like new network press. It was just sort of like, frankly, the SBN family and all that was against us. I know that a lot of y'all and a lot of our SBN family that aren't here right now, they would like put it on themselves to be word of mouth. Like the majority of people who I met who are big fans of Supernatural didn't see a commercial for it. They didn't see a billboard for it. They didn't see us on Jay Leno. Their friend told them. And that friend, their friend had told them. And so we were just like this word of mouth, like, hey, you'd love this little show, Supernatural. Super what? Supernatural. Natural what? Like it's not just trust me, just check it out. And so Walker had that same feeling. And so I think because the odds were against us, from the get-go, we were all just there for each other. And it's a bunch of Texans. Like, it's too hot there to, to be angry. It's too hot there to be mean. It's like, you know what, I'm sweating no matter what. So if I get mad about something, I'm gonna sweat more. So everybody's just pretty chill and laid back. Um, so it was difficult, but there's an awesome, awesome fellow cast and crew we have down there. Thank you. Thanks a bunch. Hi, right. I like your shirt. I just got it in the mail today. Amazing! I have one too. Hi, my name is Emily, um, and you're you're always keep finding campaign made a really big impact on me. And um, I was wondering how. Um, you're great, Emily. I'm sorry. Don't what? be sorry. Take your time. You're fine. You're surrounded. You got this. that motivation to do your work when you're having struggles with your mental health. That's been a really big struggle with me. I'm an actor and not being able to do the preparation I want to because of my mental health. Yeah. Um, great question. Thank you for 
being honest and upfront about it. Uh, that's step one. Um, you, you'll be very surprised how many people come out of the woodwork. Not, not that they're hiding, but they don't know necessarily. So when you kind of mention like, hey, I had a rough day yesterday. Like, shit, me too. You know? And so just remembering you're not alone. Um, I think the motivation... <clears throat> Sometimes you just keep moving even though you don't know why you're moving or what you're moving for. And at the end of the journey, uh, it reveals itself more often than not. Um, just being kind of grateful that, that you can, that you can explore. And you're, you're an artist, you're a storyteller as well. So trying to see, I say this to young actors a lot um, who are used to maybe doing school plays and they memorize their lines as part of their homework. Um, in between doing their math homework and their science homework. And I'm like, read your script at home. Uh, read your script in the car, not while you're driving. Uh, read your script when you're tired. Read your script when you're wide awake. Read your script, because uh, no matter what headspace you're in and where you are, it'll reveal a different part of that story that you might go like, oh, I, when I first read the script, I was just on an airplane trying to see what it was about. But then, when I woke up the next morning, I was tired and I read it, I saw this part in scene 25 that I didn't even think about when I read the first time. And then you read it on the treadmill or something, and you're like, oh, well, now that I'm energized, now I see the, that I see this in scene 12. And so just, just being mindful that, much like the finished product, like a book or a TV show or a movie or a song, an album, um, you can watch it a, a thousand times or you can listen to it a thousand times and each time it kind of means something different to you. So just be mindful of your headspace as you're working on what you're working on and see what it informs uh, in your development of a character. Thank you so Way to go, Emily. Hi, so I play roller derby and one of the things we do is kind of come up with like a cool badass nickname. So I was kind of like wondering what y'all's names would be if y'all played. Oh. Well, hey, I'm not that tough to actually play it, but, um, it'd be Moose something. Moose on wheels? Like moose over. Moose. Moose on wheels, moose, moose, it'll come to me, it'll come to me. Moose tacular. What would you be? I don't know. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little, I'm very competitive. Yes, we discussed that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that would be, I would be like, move over or I will roll over you or something. <clears throat> what would your nickname be? <laughs> yes. Oh, <no. laughs> she's a I like it. What is she your... bites. I don't know. Yeah. Did you ask me what I was? Oh, um, Ben Keith really means a lot to me, so it's Jared Smash a Lucky. Smash a Lucky! Smash a Lucky works! <laughs> well, he loves Smash Brothers, so that works too. I do. So, what is your what is your nickname? Uh, everybody just calls me Smash. Yes! Where I'll can we you. watch you? Uh, I, I play for a team called Middle Georgia Derby Demons, ironically. That's so cool! Amazing. You need a rollover ruby on your team. Yeah. <laughs> We almost had a Jensen and Snackles. Jensen and Snackles. They have to be bow legged though. <laughs> um, I'm asking, not here to defend himself. I'm asking, I know. I'm asking for a friend. Somewhere he's laughing, he doesn't know why. Uh, I'm asking for a friend, but do they make uh, roller skates and high heels? Actually, yes. You're set. I will. I know you will. I know you will. I have no, I have. No apologies, I will roll right over you. She will. She will. All right. Well, thank you, Smash. Nice to meet you. We got to try that at home. Our dad would be scary. Hi. Hi. Um, what's your favorite memory from the set of Supernatural? Wow. You start, because I have a lot more to go through. <laughs> There's so many big memories for me. Um, it makes me very emotional, as I'm sure like y'all get with the show. Um, I mean, I got to meet my part, like my whole life changed. Yeah. It really did, because I was kind of snakes. 
See, I am emotional. <laughs> what the hell? She's just trying to outcry me now. Maybe I'm hormonal. Um, no, because my life, for me, I, I, I love acting so much, and I worked really hard to get where I was, and this man changed my whole life. <laughs> I met my partner, my best friend. I mean, to be able to sit here on stage with all of you and be a part of this is so crazy to me. Um, I, did, I just thought, I'm going to keep on with my life. I'm going to keep my head forward. I love, love working. So to fall in love was so unexpected and have children <laughs> that bloom, blow, blow my mind every day is, and live in Texas. <laughs> so yeah. for me, you know, like from day one, I was so nervous. And so I feel that every, honestly, every moment on that set is really special for me. Yeah. I, I'm very, very lucky. Also, I mean, that set is pretty outstanding. I love Walker. It, I, we've just been really lucky with really lucky. people, you know, we've been able to meet and, and, and learn from and grow with and have these amazing relationships. And I mean, to come here and know so many awesome people that I get to hug and be like, oh my God, thanks for following along and loving our family and our shows. And I don't know, it's a long-winded answer, but I'm just, you know, honestly, that set for me is like, it's magic. We had, we bought, you know, we had, we had a house, we had a park, like, restaurants and a life and, like, my whole life has changed. So, the whole thing for me is like the most epic memory. It makes me emotional, so thanks a lot. Yes. No, how did you do it? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sweating, oh my God. <laughs> I'm nervous. Good, nerves are good. Um, same, I mean, relationships, for sure, and not to steal our answer, uh, but obviously meeting my life partner, my wife, mother of our children, um, was extremely special. Uh, and going back to, I mean, as we sit here now, we obviously are, are, are fans of the show and part of the SBN family. Um, to this day, it's really neat to consider myself, and this is just the way I think of myself, it's not bullshit. Like, I consider myself part of the ESPN family. I happen to be one of the guys on the screen, you know? Um, because that was my role in this family for 15 years, and hopefully again. Um, but, yeah. but to be part of something that's so much bigger than what I did, so much bigger than what Jensen did, so much bigger than what Misha and Jen and our cast and crew did, that we have our own little special pocket, you know? And I'm sad I haven't been able to go there since uh, since they called cut, since Bob called cut on that bridge, you know, we left the next day, uh, and I couldn't make it back because I got COVID, and I couldn't get stuck in Vancouver because I couldn't get back to uh, Austin time to film Walker. Uh, but I'll get back, and I, I'm certain that when I get back, the the family that we have there, it will be like no time has passed. Uh, we still text a lot of the people, and we're still we're still in touch. So, yeah, family. Thank you for that question. She has the star, legit. Hi guys, love y'all. Um, my question kind of follows with what you guys just answered. Uh, I was gonna say, how do you guys feel from going from Sam to Ruby to Cordell and Emily? Love both of them, but just wanted to know your opinion. Before you answer, I love your platforms. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, it was an interesting transition, again, because it was like I was developing Cordell uh, largely within the pandemic, and I knew Sam was right there when we went back to, to finish the last two episodes. Um, it was it was nerve wracking to get on set. It was nerve wracking to get on set day one of season four after the writer strike. I was like, I don't know if I remember how to do this. Shit, I don't know if I ever know how to do this. Um, Cordell is a lot goofier than Sam is, which I like because I'm a goofy guy. So it was fun to kind of have that freedom to be like a silly character. And Sam had his moments uh, where he was kind of comical and got to make dad jokes, this and that. Um, it's been a lot of fun to play a dad because I, I am a dad now, obviously. It's fun to play a big brother because I am a big brother uh, to a sister, but um, that's something I didn't really get to explore uh, on Super. Um, 
it was great. It's nerve wracking still, you know. Uh, Sam is still in there, uh, and I, I'll be more than ready to to put his flannel back on when the time comes. Um, but for now, I have a lot of fun uh, exploring what Cordell has to offer. You know, when I stepped into Ruby's shoes, that was very, very nerve-wracking. Y'all are very, at first, was a very intimidating audience. Um, and Katie had done such a great job with the first Ruby. So I was very, very nervous, and my audition was very different than the way she did it. And I was really nervous to try it out. Um, playing a demon is very fun. <laughs> As you know, um, no, it, it was, you know, it's something that's so out there and different and manipulative and, you know, and she justifies it all. You know, she, she's doing it in her mind for the good. Um, and I love that because it's so scary. Um, and Emily, Emily's probably closer. To me, it's not our marriage by any means, that, you know, but it is... It no, you're still alive in real life. <laughs> <laughs> I have our kids, I have four kids. Um, but it is, it's, it's super fun uh, to, play, to play off of each other in that way and bring different things to the table. Um, both are challenging and fun, and, but I think Emily is definitely a little bit, I would hope, a little bit more like me. At times, yeah. <laughs> Unless it's time to be competitive, then the ruby comes out. Then it's all, you know, out the window. But. You were great as ruby, by the way. <laughs> she was. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Hello. Hey. Um, so, this might be a silly question. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway. So, in, in, I'm going to try and get it without my, yeah. Um, so, in Supernatural, we see Sam use his scar on his hand to feel pain when he's dealing with his Lucifer hallucinations. Then, you sort of see him shift to using that as a grounding technique. Um, so when he's dealing with anxiety and just acting like, hey, is this real? Like, that's what he uses as his grounding technique. Um, so in Walker, during the scene where Cordell talks to Liam after the abduction, you're standing in that doorway, and it almost looks like you're using your hand as a grounding technique. Mm -hmm. Was that intentional? Uh, intentional, yes. <laughs> uh, connected, no. Um, it started with the, the coin in the first, or the, the poker chip, yeah. in the first couple episodes, where he's kind of like fidgety and playing with it. And I like that for, for Walker, for what he's going through, because he has to have, have this facade of like, hey, I'm a, I'm a Texas Ranger, I'm a dad, um, I'm a, a, a widow, uh, I, need, I need this to be fine. Meanwhile, you know, it's that kind of like, and I'm a fidgety guy, like Jared by nature is a fidgety guy. She gets mad sometimes because if I have my hand on her uh, pant leg, I like play with the scene. This is my scenes. <laughs> She's like, you're gonna ruin my pants. And I'm like, sorry. Man, back on it. And then like, it's just like tactile or something. I don't know what it is. Um, it's a grounding thing, yeah. A grounding thing, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's something I do do, you know, like I'll sort of like play with my fingers or. Kind of kind of, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so intentional, yes. I was aware I was doing it, not between action and cut. But when I was going through the lines and what Walker was going through and just kind of like getting rid of nervous energy. And that's also like in, in therapy, like I go to therapy every week, there's a technique to calm your nervous system. You know, much like if you have a button, but like when kids have pent up energy, it's like go, go for a run around the neighborhood, go for a bike ride to get rid of some energy. There's also nervous energy. You also have nerves and neurons firing and there are ways to kind of like tremor it out. And so I think that it must have been an accident. I was aware that I was kind of like, doing that and I was I guess I was more aware when one of our directors, I don't remember which one, was like, oh, uh, let's get a close up of his hand. And I was like, oh I guess I'm I guess it's obvious. So they wanted they wanted just like an insert of me kind of like shaking it out, you know? I was like, yeah, cool. Like like it tells a good story. But I hadn't put the two together until just now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, right. So, Jen, I recently met uh, Mark Rolston, who played the original Alistair. I know, big fan favorite. Um, and he wanted me to tell you hi, because I was meeting here and I forgot to write an autograph. But that made me think of torture scenes yeah. and how strange that might be for an actor to film those. So I'm just curious, as actors, how do you, what's the preparation, I guess, and experience of 
filming scenes where your characters are like in extreme physical dress? Yeah. Well, you know. I do. <laughs> um, that one in particular, that was very challenging for many reasons. Um, but, you know, there were a lot of things about that scene that were very uncomfortable. And so in that moment, you have to make sure for me that you have people around you that you can touch, you know, like Jared was talking about um, in scenes and finding the creativity and making it new um, and going back and like recharging your battery. In scenes like that, you really need, or I needed someone there with me that I can like tell bad jokes with or say, hey, can I have, you know, a hug or hold my hand for a sec? Because you just need a moment of like, because it is really uncomfortable, you know, in that particular scene, I'm like half naked, which is in itself really vulnerable and weird. And then there's this guy who's somehow holding this knife around me that's very vulnerable and weird again. And so there's a lot of it that is, it's, it's scary. And so psychologically, you have to, one, like stuff it down, but use it. And so in using that, you're kind of, your body's going through this traumatic situation. And so afterwards, I need a minute just to kind of like, I, you know, I like to tell bad jokes and have a, I have a really bad sense of humor, so I just need that to, like, ah, to shake it off psychologically, you know. And so I also don't hate my captor at the end of it, too. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. yeah, great question. I, I've, never, um, I've never heard you ask that question in public. Um, those kinds of sequences are really challenging. And, you know, it's, it's even worse if you're literally in a uh, physically compromised position, but Jensen and I both did several where we're being tortured. No one's restraining us, we're fully clothed, but the demon is holding us against the wall and, you know, squeezing our insides. You're still putting, um, we're not method actors. I'm not a method actor, he's not, Jen's not. Um, where we stay in character in, in between takes and whatnot, in between scenes. Uh, but still, you try and get yourself there, and your body doesn't really know the difference. They did a study, I think it was in Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, where they had people watch a cartoon with a pencil and their teeth like this, and then one uh, group of like 50 people watch it like this, with the pencil. So some people were kind of like a, a smile, and some people were kind of in a frown. And they asked the questions afterwards, and the people who were, whose face was smiling, because they had a pencil, had a better experience. They were like, yeah, that was funny. And the people who were like this, we're like, no, I don't really like it. Like, it's your body doesn't know that you're fake crying. Your body just knows you're crying. Your body doesn't know that you're fake grimacing. Your body just knows you're grimacing. Um, and it can be, it's, it's far more difficult to shoot a sequence like that than it is like a fight scene. Like a fight scene, you're like, oh, uh, I'm sweating. Like, just give me some water. Or like, oh, I need a banana, you know? Um, and thinking about the, the barn sequence with Jensen and me, it was really difficult because we shot the fight sequence up to Jensen is next to a post and I'm putting my blade in saying like, okay, let's get out of here. And that was day one. Day two, we started out like, okay, let's get out of here, going to what do you mean you can't move kind of situation. And so at the beginning of day two of shooting that entire barn sequence, Sam starts out victorious. You know, like he and his brother just saved these kids. Like badass, we vanquished, whatever, six vampires. We still got it, you know, like good, good. And then like, why is Dean making a funny look? Like we, we should get, man, we should find those kids. And then going to, you know, the hand dropping uh, and saying bye. And then it was like, cut, okay, back to one. And I'm like, okay, we're going for the machete, right? Okay, just like, you had to take, you had, like it took, it took a second to like get back to, Okay, like get to a place where Sam, Sam and his brother just saved some kids, like in a pretty badass way. Um, and so doing that a few times, and Bob Singer, who was directing it, uh, is fantastic. And so he knew, like, hey, you take your time. If you want to go to your trailer for 10, 15 minutes or longer, do it. Like, get back to where you were uh, before the first take. So those emotionally taxing scenes are far more tiring than, like, a scene where you're, you're running from zombies or something, but nothing happens. Um, great question, man. We appreciate what you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. How are you? I am great. Wonderful. Um, Jared, my question is for Jen. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> hi. 
I'm a big fan of your literacy efforts, yeah. and I was curious of your plans. Um, I gave you that book, My Forbidden Face, yeah. and yeah. as a world history professor, I see that that cultural understanding is lacking a lot among students. Of, of reading? I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and reading is so fundamental to understanding yeah. everything else. Everything, absolutely. So is your question on, do you have further plans for your literacy campaigns? Absolutely. Um, we did a campaign last year with the Austin Library um, that was really big. Uh, I also, we did um, an Instagram Live with an LGBTQIA bookstore, I believe, in Minnesota. And I'm sorry, I'm on the spot. I, so I'm forgetting, I'm blanking on the name. Um, but in, in terms of literacy, you know, there's twofold for us. One, you know, I, I love a great story, an interesting story. I'd love to develop some of those stories and, and hopefully they can see a different medium. Um, but also, literacy in itself is quite important. We have young children. It's important that they have access to books so they can see the world in a way and understand others and, you know, <laughs> you know, other voices and communities. Um, that's how we learn. And we learn when we get to read voices that are not like us and voices that are similar and we had no idea. So, Or voices that look like them. Yes, or them, thank you, exactly. And that's what, um, for me, representation is very, very important, so. Yeah. <laughs> to that point, um, as well, I heard something one time um, and I loved it. And it's, it's, you know, we don't have to read, we get to read. You know, like I wish, I wish the world at large saw it for what a blessing it is. Like it's a superpower. You know, there, there are probably billions of human beings out there who haven't been fortunate enough to be able to be taught how to read. I remember when I grew up in San Antonio, um, it was not realistic for me to assume that I was going to be able to travel outside of Texas at any point in my life. But I got to travel the world in books, you know? I got to read about different cultures and different times, and I got to, like, live a whole life through other people's words. And I get to do that to some extent now and help tell that story in the medium that I happen to work in. But we don't have to read, we get to read. Great job. Keep it up, Thank, Thank you. you. You're badass. Okay, do it. What's the best lesson that project has taught you, and what lesson was it? Uh, I'm gonna go with Supernatural. There were so many lessons I learned. Um, one of the lessons I kind of took was embracing the day-to-day, -day, and that's helped uh, Emily to a prior question about getting through tough times, whatever the situation. Um, but another I learned along the way was don't wait for life to happen. This is life. You know, like, don't, don't just go like, well, if I do two more seasons, I can go to this place, or I can stop doing this, or move there, or buy this or that. It's like, this is life. Like, enjoy it, because this is life. And not everybody's promised 80 years or more on this planet. And so try and make the most every day and do something every day that you're, you're going to enjoy, that makes you you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I also think, you know, there are times where acting is really scary, and I know for me, my, I'm very self-deprecating at times. I'll do a scene, and I'm like, oh my god, that was so bad, that was so terrible, I can't watch it, this is awful. And what I've learned um, through that process, and probably on each project, is to be really kind and forgiving. Um, one of the things, I, I, one of the questions about like, how do you stay motivated? Um, for me, it's saying kind words to myself after doing a take, or looking in the mirror and going like, you're awesome, you can do this. You know. And that, for me, has been a lesson that I've taken into life, you know, when I'm doubting. Thank you. This will be our last hey. question. This will be the, our last question. We're running out of time, guys. Okay, final okay. question. Hi, guys. How Hi. are you? Hi. Hi. Um, okay, so this is a walk of question. So, we've seen um, Emily in flashbacks. We've seen her get angry, we've seen her be happy, we've seen her different kinds of emotions. Is there um, a, an emotion or something that you guys would like to explore 
in the next season, hopefully, or something that she doesn't come back, was there like some sort of feeling that you wanted to explore? Like for us to see, like... Yeah, uh, great question. That was great. I think for me, and one of the things that we I got to explore on Supernatural um, and loved was the imperfection. Like, you know, uh, oftentimes when somebody leaves the world too soon, our memories tend towards the, the, the beautiful, the beatific, the positive. Um, and I think there's something really interesting to me about characters and relationships that seeing their flaws, but how they move past it. You know, no marriage is perfect. No marriage is like, oh, every day is so easy. And the kids behaved and they got straight A's and they weren't mean at school and no one was mean to them. Like, it's not realistic. There are tough days where you haven't slept, where someone had a, a car cut them off on the road and you're just lack of patience or whatever. Uh, and seeing how people, how two people can love each other uh, and get through tough times. We saw so many times with Sam and Dean. Um, granted, they were both living for most of the episodes. Um, but I, I, w I would love to explore that. Yeah, I, to echo what Jared's saying, I agree, like to play the mundane, and I think when someone has passed, that memory is of how perfect they were and how great the relationship was and how wonderful and she, you know, carried the family and, and speaking about Emily, um, I would really love to explore the flaws in that, in the mundane, you know, the bickering, the fighting, like normal shit, like who put the, who didn't put like, you know, the tube on the toothpaste or put the milk out and spoil, you know, like little things like that or didn't take the kids to school on time. Or, you know, those things that you can really see. I don't know why she's gesturing at me during this. because <laughs> it's, it's all me. No, but those kinds of things that you can really see more, because right now it's through mostly his eyes, right? Um, through Cordell's eyes. So to be able to see it really, and, and the dynamics also with the parents. Mm. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for that question. Yeah, love you guys. I love you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes. Love you all so much. Thank you so much for bringing us out here. It's awesome. Please give a huge round of applause, everybody, for Jan and Jared Badalecki. What a huge round of applause. Now, you guys have a chance. If you want, you can go meet them and meet them at their booth and get an autograph or a photo. You can scan this QR code right up here. If you do that, you guys can go have a chance to meet them and continue on the conversation. By the way, they can still hear you. What